Well, greetings, scattered sheep. I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I'm. Uh, this is the second try in trying to do the the show, and I'm not sure if we're having a little bit of technical issues where I can't hear my guest. Okay, this is kind of terrible to to do this, but anyway, we will we'll start this over again and uh, wait and see if our guest comes on. And our guest is David Keesling. But you know, perhaps the enemy really doesn't want us to interview the attorney of Kara Crouch, the granddaughter of Jan and Paul Crouch, who was just re- who recently won the case against TBN for damages that she suffered when she was raped as a teenager while she was uh, attending a praise-a-thon with her grandmother in Atlanta back in 2006. So, uh, you know, it's I uh, went to the closing arguments, um, uh, it was a week ago last Wednesday, and was very impressed with her attorney's final arguments. The closing arguments were absolutely excellent. In fact, I was, I had told him later, boy, I think you could be a preacher. And uh, he kind of laughed at that because his closing arguments were so impassioned and really, I think, were touching onto the jury because I was observing the jury and they were, I could see some of them holding back tears when he talked about what she endured as a child. And this was all by uh, Trinity Broadcasting Networks trying to cover up what happened to her, not reporting what happened to her. Jan Crouch did not report her what happened to her because she didn't want it to, to look bad on TBN. She just told her nephew, attorney John Casoria, to do what he can to just whatever's you know good for TBN. No, not what's good for Kara, but what was good for TBN. And of course this had such an impact on this young lady's life. And so um, we're still waiting for our guests to, to come in again. I'll play another song just to see if he can hear the song. So maybe he can hear me and we'll see if we can actually get something going. I mean, I, I uh, don't usually do live interviews. And so I'm kind of, uh, testing the waters here. Uh, are you on the line, Mr. Keesling? Jackie, I am on the line. All right. Well, you know, we'll fix it all in post, <laughs> post edit, <laughs> but I, I just can't believe all what we went through. You know, when things like this happen, I just can't help but thinking the enemy is working full time. And uh, I tell you, when, when you go against you know, the kind of people that you well know <laughs> that uh, are kind of dangerous in the spirit realm, then these things can happen. But anyway, greetings to my guest, David Keesling. Should I call you David, Mr. Keesling, Dr. Keesling? What do I refer oh, yeah. to you as? No, you can call me David. That would be just fine with me. I, I don't, uh, I, I try not to put on too much um, of, of airs in terms of things of that nature, but uh, you call me David, I'll be fine with that, Jack. David, I am so glad that you joined us here on the Scattered Sheep Report because it's just so important to uh, c- cover this when I feel like the Christian press has really dropped the ball on this whole case. And uh, for for you that are just joining us, I I gave a little capsule of the case that uh, Mr. Keesling just won on behalf of Kara Crouch. And uh, David, could you sort of, you know, and from your point of view, give us a thumbnail sketch of the case? Sure. Um, April 24th of 2006, um, Kara attended a Trinity Broadcasting Network praise thon in Atlanta, Georgia. As you know, they've done two, I think as many as four in, in a year where they have praise a much like a Jerry Lewis telethon, so to speak, to raise money and to get increased donations. Again, important, that was April 24th of 2006. And while she was there, um, after the last event of the telethon, an employee of Trinity um, got access to her. He was 30 years old. She was 13. And from that, uh, there was a sexual assault that took place that was pretty traumatic for her. Um, the thing that made that critical in terms of this lawsuit was not the suit against him. That wasn't the point. There were some reasons why that didn't occur as a matter of law, and Trinity had their hand in that. But because 
Jan Crouch, within 36 hours after this event took place, Carol was back in Orange County, California. She was in front of her grandmother, and instead of her grandmother offering her the kind of thing that you would expect a grandmother, which is love, unconditional love, help, assistance, her grandmother castigated her. And I think you wrote an article that kind of borrowed from the alliteration that I'd used in, in, in argument in that case, which was blamed, branded, and broken. And that's exactly what happened to Kara. Her grandmother, Jan Crouch, at that time, the vice president, one of the founders of Trinity Broadcasting Network, you know, went on a tirade when Kara and her mother presented to her to ask for prayer, to ask for healing, and to ask for help from this guy that had done what he had done to, to this young child at that time. And, um, and so that's the basis of the lawsuit. There were two causes of action that we went to trial on. One was um, the outrageous behavior of Jan Crouch that resulted in an intentional infliction of emotional distress to Kara. And the second one was negligence. In other words, under California law, the Child Abuse Neglect Reporting Act, if you are an ordained minister and you get information that a child has been either abused or neglected, or you have uh, reasonable suspicion, you reasonably can suspect that this has happened, then you have an obligation under the law to report it. And if you don't, and you violate the law, and there are damages to the person who would have been the beneficiary of that report, then you could be held liable for that. And that's kind of a thumbnail sketch. Now, I'll tell you, that doesn't sound like such a horrible lawsuit. I mean, the facts are pretty bad, but often lawsuit facts are bad. But what made this horrible is in 2006, not only did they do nothing about it, but they blamed Kara for her own sexual assault, her own molestation. This was an organization that was making over $100 million a year in donations. And you know what they did? They had a chance, a platform to make an impact worldwide for abused women, for abused children, for people that are in need of help. And they chose not to. What they chose to do is protect their bottom line by protecting the bad PR and the bad press that they were concerned about. And that was the kind of testimony that came out in trial. And ultimately, I think that was uh, important in giving perspective to why this lawsuit was an important thing to bring forward. It's never too late to help children. It's never too late to put people in need in front of yourself. But for Trinity and for Jane Crouch, it was too late. She didn't just ignore the needs of a child. She ignored the needs of her own grandchild. And, and that was really, in my opinion, one of the things that made this lawsuit so important to pursue. Because when you see that type of behavior in people or from people in leadership positions, uh, you know, good people just have to stand up and say enough's enough. And that was too much. You know, David, and, uh, again, sitting... 11 years to get to trial. So it took a long time. Wow. David, when I was listening to your closing arguments, which I think was absolutely wonderful, stupendous, um, you were so impassioned. I think I could even see some of the, especially the women on the jury, just kind of blinking back tears. They, I could see they were very sympathetic. And yeah, one of you were uh, the, the uh, TVN attorney, Michael King. He objected when you said that they hammered away at at Kara. Could you describe what that was? Because I certainly wasn't in court the, at the time when she was sitting there on the stand, and you said that. They wouldn't give her any chance to explain, but they just kept yelling yes or no answers at her and not letting her explain anything. How did that day go that you were referencing? Well, there were two events that I was referencing there, primarily her deposition. They took her deposition within about a month after this lawsuit was filed in 2012, and she was very young. She had yet to have any meaningful treatment for the you know, the emotional challenges that she suffered as a result of this sexual assault and then primarily the result of the grandmother's complete obliteration of her um, shortly after it happened, and that's the main focus. And then that there was, you know, without any intervention, she continued to suffer and suffer and suffer. So in that deposition, they deposed her over a period of about nine, I think it ranged between nine and ten hours, 
and you had five lawyers in the room or five different people in the room, including lawyers, um, that were asking her questions. And these were questions that were horrible questions, questions such as, well, did you tell him goodbye or kiss him goodbye on his way out the door? Um, How does it feel to have a dad that doesn't love you? And were you wearing panties? At that time in your life, did you make a practice of wearing panties? Um, Just, you know, did you did you thank him for a good time? You know, that type of horrible attack on Uh, her uh. at deposition. Then they played it back and see the goal. The goal at that deposition early on, right after this lawsuit was filed, was to be so vile, so horrible to her, in my opinion that she would dismiss the case, that she would say, you know what, this isn't worth it. I can't go up against this multi, multi, multi-million dollar company and have any chance of success because if I do, this is what I can expect, all right? This is the bullying, and this is the tactic I can expect. And if you don't think that causes someone to suffer, it does, okay? Unfortunately, unfortunately, under the law, there are certain protected behaviors for lawyers and their conduct. doesn't mean it's ethical, but it doesn't mean that it's unlawful. And so that was one aspect of what they did to Kira because they played some of her deposition during trial, and it was deposition uh, tape where they were asking her like questions like bullets coming out of a gun, just yes or no, boom, 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 boom. And she was trying to respond, but they were never giving her an adequate opportunity to explain herself. And as a result of that, that created some substantial challenges on the record. So the other thing to keep in mind is during the course of her testimony at trial she took the stand we put her on and she was on the stand from one day to the next and it became very clear that Kara has matured that Kara has now a better understanding of what was important um, about this fact which was that it was not her fault she's been in therapy she's had some things that have changed in a positive way for her because of that type of intervention and she stood up to it like a champ I mean like an absolute champ. And they got to the point where I think opposing counsel got very frustrated. And and then instead of allowing her to answer questions, they tried to dictate that her answers could only be yes and no, yes and no, yes and no. And, And Jackie, the reason that happens a lot of times is because lawyers don't want the entire truth to be told. They just want their piece of the truth to be told so then they can manipulate it and they can twist it and they can shape it to try to um, create the imagery or the optics or the storyline or the narrative that they want. And that's exactly what happened in this case. And so when we got the closing argument, I wanted to make that point. I wanted to make the point that what are they so scared of? Why wouldn't they let Kara talk? Why wouldn't they give her an opportunity to share her voice with the world, particularly this jury, because the truth matters more than spin. Her story what? is her story, and it should matter more. And I think any time you have jurors that have spent weeks, we had 36 days from start to finish in that trial. And when jurors put their life aside, they put their family aside, they put their jobs aside, they put their economic status aside, they put everything aside. They go in there, they have a number assigned to them, not even a name. They put their name aside for 36 days to simply listen and understand the facts that are available to them. And they don't want you to try to distort that. They don't want you to limit that. And they don't want you to say yes or no. They want to know the details. And so I thought it was important in closing the argument to point that out to them because as a lawyer, it's my job to help that jury understand, to share with them all of the facts, not just the facts that I want them to hear and let them make their decision. Wow. Uh, you know, another thing they, they tried to use as an excuse in their own closing arguments was that Jan Crouch wasn't there to defend herself. And yet this, this case was filed by Kara five years ago, and certainly Jan was alive and well somewhere in Orlando, Florida, five years ago. Um, do you think, I mean, I, I speculate that they just kept extending and extending and, and finding ways to um, keep this case going on and on and on. And then when Jan died, then they felt it was safe to take it, to let it go to trial. Can you elaborate on that at all? I I can give you my opinion. My, what I think is, is the way it went down. See, Jan Crotch was deposed twice in this case, two separate times. She sat for deposition and you know, it was as much of a 
crazy show as you can imagine. Um, every time that those depositions took place, obviously it was a production. You know, there were, uh, you know, half a dozen or more lawyers involved. There were bodyguards. There were handlers. I mean, it really became a production. And 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 this was the, uh, you know, as I knew her, the life of Jan. And and it was never, it was never handled in my opinion in a way that would have been a typical deposition because everyone doesn't get that type of celebrity uh, entourage at a deposition. So she took two. Those both took place in 2014. Um, and she was evasive. And what she wasn't evasive about, then she claimed she didn't recall. And, of course, no one knows if she really recalled the facts or not. I have my opinions. But she would claim that she didn't recall, and she would, re- she would certainly recall the facts that she thought were important for her defense, um, but wouldn't recall the facts that were important from the perspective of Kara. And so – I think what they wanted to do is avoid as much as possible Jan being present in the courtroom and her appearance being present in the courtroom because it's very difficult. And and I don't know, Jackie, if you've ever had a chance to be in the room up close and personal with Jane Crouch, (laughs) but (laughs) it, it, it was a sight to behold. And um, it wasn't, it wasn't typical. It wasn't the type of experience that I have ever had with the hundreds and hundreds of deponents and trial witnesses that I've been involved with in the past. It was very odd. It was very much stage and production and makeup and hair and more makeup and more hair and more makeup and more hair and and eyelashes. (laughs) It was just odd, to say the least. And to be honest with you, I I, I think – that that type of imagery in a courtroom, if I were a defendant, a lawyer defending Trinity, I would want to do everything I could to avoid putting Jan's image in front of them. And let me give you an example. <laughs> we had video of her deposition that we had cut to play. They did everything they could to try to preclude us from being able to put that video in. They then used a photograph of Jan that was, I believe, from the uh, mid-90s before this physical transformation with what appears to be um, you know, plastic surgeries and things like that occurred. And it, it, was, it was a nice picture of Jan. She looked what I would say is normal in the picture, um, mm-hmm. as normal as, as she's ever looked to my knowledge. Now, I've met Jan's sister, and Jan's sister, I believe, was a year or two older than Jan, She's a very nice, well-put-together lady. Um, She doesn't have all of that preservation work done. And she looks age-appropriate and was a very nice, well-spoken, articulate lady. And and she gave a deposition, did well, well, did real well. But Jan was completely different. And I think the concern on the part of the attorneys was that her image would be so off-putting to people that did not follow her that it may cause them to have challenges with her credibility because I've got to be honest with you. It doesn't, it, it appeared as a show. And when you, when you appear as you're doing a show, it's very difficult for people to find credibility in that. Yeah. In fact, you use the term sideshow that the defense seemed to be putting on. And, and certainly it seems like they, weren't really saying much about the case and as far as the rape and everything went, except, of course, Mr. Uh, King started out saying that, oh, he's not some heartless slob. You know, he admitted that the girl had been raped and he's not heartless about it. Um, do you do you feel that uh, the, any of the attorneys on that side had had any any heart or compassion for Kara at all? Well, um you know, I know, I know, Mr. King, and I don't believe that he has an ill will towards Kara at all. Um, I believe he wanted to defend his client, and he had a very tough position to be in. And certainly, I don't blame him for telling the jury that he isn't. You know, he's not a horrible person that's heartless. I mean, I think that makes sense that he would tell the jury that. However, during the course of this 
case, um, I think Trinity and their lawyers got so focused on defending the case at times that they that they lost focus on the fact this was still a 13 year old child who was very vulnerable at the time, who was mistreated horribly by Gene Crouch, and no amount of no amount of celebrity and no amount of optics and imagery that you can create around a circumstance like that justifies that type of behavior. And, you know, um, in, as a lawyer, we often talk about avoiding, you know, trying to avoid being captured and the, and the term captured that I talk about when I talk to people about this, um, is you never want to have that one client that's such a big part of your business. That's such a, a monumental impact on your bottom line that they capture you and they'll get you to do whatever they say, no matter what. And you'll just jump in line behind them and do whatever they tell you because, Hey, they're a huge part of my bottom line. I felt like at times, and I don't know all the details of their business practices, the lawyers for, for Trinity, but I felt like at times th- that it felt like if Trinity wanted it done, they would be willing to do it no matter what. And, and we've seen that with, Kara's sister and her former brother-in-law and other circumstances that they seem to have no willingness to to pull back the reins at all if they think they can benefit from it. And, you know, it just kind of reminded me of why it's important not to be captured by a client because sometimes even the lawyers need to say to their client, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not willing to go that far, particularly if going that far has no legal merit and it's just harmful to people, just destructive to people. And, you know, this case is an example where the legal merit of some of the activity that took place in it, um, it was questionable in my opinion. Now, how come I wanted to ask you this? I was very shocked to sit there and hear and see my name show up on the screen um, as somehow part of some uh, conspiracy on behalf of the Crouch sisters of Kara and Brittany. And uh, could you explain how, because you also told me when I spoke to you during the break that my name had been brought up in, in depositions and everything. Who brought up my name and, other, you know, and how, how was my name brought into it and par- how, what kind of a conspiracy was I part of? Because that I'm re- very uh, baffled by. Yeah, everybody's baffled by that. It, it just was so nonsensical. So let me give you an idea of what that was about. You know, when you have nothing to talk about in your defense, you make up stuff, I suppose, which seemed to be the bottom line for this trial. And that would, those were the sideshows I was talking about. So um, one of the sideshows of the defense was to say, well, <clears throat> this is all a big conspiracy. So you should question the merit of Kara's claims based on the fact that this really isn't something that's horrible. This is just a big conspiracy created between Kara and her brother, former brother-in-law, Michael Coper, and her sister, Brittany. And the fact is that none of this stuff is really what it seems to be, and you shouldn't give it any credit. And here's what they used to show that it was a conspiracy. Michael and Brittany had their challenges with Trinity, which I believe you know, Michael and Brittany just got, have just been worn down by Trinity. I don't think they're... They have a lack of merit, but they've just been worn down by Trinity. Um, And somehow, because Brittany, as a loving sister, should, and because Michael, at that time, as a brother-in-law, probably should, help an 18-year-old girl um, get access to the legal system and pursue a claim once she became an age of majority and able to do so. It um, coincided with Michael and Brittany also having legal troubles with Trinity and Trinity tried to capitalize on that timing to suggest that Kara's challenge was not real. And this was just somehow something that she was put up to by her sister and former brother-in-law. The fact is that's absurd. And the reason it's absurd is this, all of the events that involve Kara's sister and former brother-in-law all transpired long after April of 2006 when Kara was assaulted in Atlanta. In fact, the brother-in-law wasn't part of the picture during that time. There was no marriage, and the sister, Brittany, was living in New York, going to school at St. John's. So it was so silly to suggest that at 13, 
a young lady would allow herself to be mauled by a 30-year-old man in a, in a deviant sexual way and then somehow put that ace up her sleeve so later on in the event she needed to use it, she could engage in some type of conspiracy to extort money from Trinity for their you know, mishandling of it. And that would help her by helping her sister, and it would help her sister by being able to bring Trinity to their knees, so to speak, in their public image. That's crazy. The timing on that, particularly the 11 or 12 year gap between those things, uh, d doesn't even give that even a hint of credibility. And in my opinion, Jackie, the jury didn't mess with it either. They didn't believe it for a second. If Trinity wanted to use a conspiracy theory, this wasn't the case they should use it in because the bottom line was I think it hurt their credibility. It didn't help them at all. And one of the things they said, you know, you'll love this because this is where you kept coming up. You had done a radio show with Brittany, mm -hmm. and there was a discussion at one point about doing one with Kara, which did not materialize. Mm -hmm. But Trinity described that to the jury through Trinity's lawyer, John Casoria. They described it to the jury as Kara having gone on a media campaign to hurt Trinity, when in fact there was no media campaign. It's kind of like I said in trial, you know, General Patton went on campaigns. Douglas MacArthur went on campaigns. You know, Norman Schwarzkopf had a campaign. Kara had one interview with a newspaper, and she didn't even do the radio with Jackie Alnor as they all wanted to talk about. And so that wasn't a campaign. One interview with a newspaper uh, does not make for a campaign. It was just an over-exaggeration by Trinity. They literally got on the stand, Jackie, and referred to themselves as being victims under attack by this conspiracy between Kara and her sister and former brother-in-law. And to be honest with you, I don't think that anyone perceived them in any shape, way, or form as victims. You know, David, I was shocked to see them putting up Brittany's private emails up on the screen in, in their uh, closing arguments. How could the, anybody be able to get through a court order somebody's private emails aren't private emails private don't we have a right to privacy how can someone uh you know subpoena private emails in a civil case can you explain that part sure ken you have a right to privacy guaranteed um against government intervention so we talk about the bill of rights for example and we talk about the Fourth Amendment, which precludes people, the government, not people, but the government from getting access to your private papers and things without a reasonable suspicion that results in a finding of probable cause by a neutral magistrate to issue a warrant and allow that to happen, assuming it's not as part of arrest or something of that nature. And so typically the government can only do that if they have a court order that says they can and then – even that court order can be later challenged and cause that evidence to be thrown out. In a civil case, it's not a government actor. In other words, your, your right to privacy is against the government from coming in and getting access to your information. But if you're part of a civil suit, that right of privacy is somehow compromised because you have claimed, you have claimed, hey, I have these challenges, and if there are emails resulting in conversations about these challenges – Assuming they are on point and they're not privileged in some way, such as doctor, patient, attorney, client, things of that nature, then if that occurs, then those emails can be subpoenaed, searched, and utilized. Now, that doesn't make them relevant, and it doesn't make them admissible. In this case, um, <laughs> through what I think were several rulings that made zero uh, sense to me, um, but ultimately, I, you know, I'm not taking too much of an issue with it. Um, those emails were allowed to be put in play in the case, um, even though they were not from people who had testified in the case. So they were hearsay documents, and they wanted to use those hearsay documents of Brittany against Kara, even though only one of them ever included Kara on it, and Kara had testified she had never seen the email before or read it. The rest of the documents were just discussions between other people who had never been in the courtroom. 
And so that was a huge challenge from a hearsay perspective. I don't think they should have been allowed in, but ultimately I think they had little to zero impact on this jury because the jury ultimately found in favor of Karen. That you know, was part it of the seems sideshow. Like, yeah, and it seemed like another tactic of theirs was what I would consider ad hominem ar- ar- you know, arguments tearing down uh, Brittany's mother and Brittany's father and, and, and her mother's friends and her friends and, and everybody else. And in fact, in their closing argument, they made some passing reference to, to her father, Paul Crouch Jr., as having something to do with pornography. Did I hear that right? You did. And, and the fact is, you know, I know Paul Crouch Jr., and, um, and I, I think that they are taking advantage of circumstances to create, once again, imagery about a man because they think that that would be the only scapegoat for Jan's behavior is to blame her son or blame Tawny, uh, Kara's mother. I have met with both of those people on numerous occasions. I believe Paul Crouch Jr. to be an honest man. I don't believe him to have the vices that they claim. The same thing would apply to Tawny. I think Tawny had struggles as a result of this circumstance. I think she stood by Kara from the start to finish. She clearly did. Um, and, uh, you know, I think she just struggled because, you know, Tawny wasn't getting any help from Trinity. Tawny wasn't getting much in the way of support at all. And as a mom, you know, people want to question why didn't she do more to help her daughter she did what she thought was best for her daughter. That may have been the best thing. It may have not been the best thing. But she did what she thought was the best at the time. And the one thing I told the jury, and I'm sure you heard it, is you can question whether she made the right choices or not, but you can't question whether she was making those choices with a heart of love towards her daughter. She clearly was. Jane Crouch clearly did not. And if you have and to criticize and, Tony, yeah. criticize her for making a bad choice, but don't criticize her for being a bad mom because she did what she thought she should do. And don't you think that she was intimidated by her mother-in-law, especially from what I understand? I know the two are divorced now, but that they were in the middle of separation at that time, so there was already problems in the household, and don't you think she was intimidated by her mother-in-law? No, there's no question. And, you know, we've talked to them, and they weren't communicating well, and, and, uh, Paul and Tawny weren't at that time, which can happen a lot of times in a divorce case, but they were having challenges themselves. And, and there had been uh, kind of a, a common theme, I think for a long time between the two of them. So that, that, that in and of itself is not a surprise, but um, you know, Jane Crouch had a way of intimidating um, everybody. And when you listen to people tell you, um, about Jan, she also had a was known to have a habit for tirades, and and if she didn't uh, like something, she would certainly be the first to let you know. And when she did, there was very seldom anybody that would misunderstand her intent because she was pretty clear in the word choices that she used. It certainly didn't sound like the word choices of an ordained minister. No, and you know what? They also tried to make the point or tried to say that it wasn't in Jan's character to behave that way. And yet I know personally on, um, from so many people that have been very close to Jan Crouch that she, you know, cussed like a sailor, that she was very intimidating. I was, in fact, in the 80s, I was on one of the TV shows on TBN, not Praise the Lord, but one of the other shows, and the host would say that they would all make jokes like saying she's the you know what from upstairs and and when she come was coming down the stairs they'd all warn get to your places you know because they were all scared of her and uh, another friend of mine heard her over on the telephone she was at um one of uh, somebody who I won't give his name but he still has and has had a, his own show on TBN and he got a call when she was when my friend and and, and another person I know was over there at the house and he got a phone call from her and she started cussing him out and he took the phone and held it away from his ear and they could hear Jan Crouch just you know going into this whole tirade with F bombs and all of that because she was mad at him at something he said on the air. So, you know, she did have that reputation. And yet, did you, since they tried to make the claim she didn't, could you have brought 
witnesses on to, that worked there and could testify to Jan's reputation of being a foul mouth tyrant? We, we could have probably gone that route. We made what I think is the best decision under those circumstances to let the jury make the determination. Let me tell you why. And the jury did. And again, the jury believed, believed this because they found in our favor in that respect. Um, they wanted to portray her as just a grandmother, just a grandmother receiving information from a granddaughter and from a daughter-in-law. The problem that they had is not that she was a grandmother. The problem they had is that every action she took in respect to what happened as a result of Kara and her mother reporting this this horrible crime um, was not anywhere reflective of a grandmother. It was completely reflective of someone <laughs> who, just as you described, was on a crazed tirade of, of anger and upset. And we learned through Paul Crouch Jr., who testified to this in 2012 and in deposition. He also testified to this in trial. We learned from Paul Crouch Jr. that the reason that she was so angry was because she didn't want the bad PR. And you have to understand the timing of all of this event. You see, just years before, right up to the time of this event in April 2006, there had been claims made by a guy named Lonnie or Enoch Lonnie Ford about improprieties on the part of Paul Crouch Sr. That's right. Jan's husband. And that had been very public, as you might recall. And sure. that was a scandal that, that in, in all likelihood cost them some donors and cost them some money, which they seemed to have a desire for. And <laughs> as a result of that, um, imagine what would happen if you finally get that thing under wraps, you finally get it settled, and then the next thing that pops up is an employee, then um, sexual assault or molest a 13-year-old Crouch granddaughter. Mm. And <laughs> once again, here we are with the risk of going back into the media and going public again. Let me tell you the problem. If you'll remember during the course of their closing, they talked about how it was silly that Jan would be concerned about the PR because, you know, Kara was a 13-year-old, and things that happen to juveniles, they never put their names out. They never say anything about it. And so that would all be covered up, right? You probably heard that, right, Jackie? Yep. But yes. here's, the, here's the problem with that. They're trying to, again, fool the jury because what they're not saying is, but the arrest of the 30-year-old man would have been public, right? So mm-hmm. Kara's treatment might have been private. But if they would have done their job and reported this predator to the authorities rather than let him go on the streets and never be known for what he was, no telling how many other cares there may be as a result of that, then that would certainly have been public. And you know what he would have likely done? He would have likely said, well, I've got information about what's going on at Trinity, or I've got information about things that they probably don't want known. Because most people, when they get in a corner, come out like a, like a scared animal and start scratching and clawing in defense of sure. themselves. And sure. so you could anticipate that, and I think they did. And when you've been working, you worked for Trinity for eight years. When you've worked behind the curtain at Trinity for eight years, you probably know what goes on behind that purple veil, and they probably know that you know what goes on behind that purple veil. Precisely the reason they wanted to make a deal with this guy rather than have this guy go out in public and say what he knew. And, and, and why was in my opinion about it? Why wasn't he on the stand in this case? Well, he he was deposed, but in every question uh, that was asked of him, he took the fifth. He brought brought in a lawyer who advised him uh, on the effects of the the laws of the state of Georgia and other laws that could be applicable to him. And instead of testifying and coming in and saying. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. This is incorrect. No, I wasn't there. I was there, but I did I did something different. When asked all those questions, including did you rape or did you molest care crash, he says, upon the advice of my counsel, I'm going to take the Fifth Amendment and not testify as it may be you know, harmful to me if I do. So well, th- that kind of information in California doesn't come in at a civil trial. 
Okay, but doesn't he owe her part of that $2 million since Jan Kraut was found liable for only 45% of it? Well, it's an interesting thing that you say that because um, I don't believe that Jan Kraut is going to be able to escape um, with 45% of it. We have a hearing on Monday. Um, the verdict came in on last Monday, the 6th, uh, the 5th, came in on the 5th. And um, the judge ordered that I create the judgment. So we have a verdict by a jury, and then that gets reduced to a judgment, which is entered in the record, and then we enforce the judgment. Mm -hmm. um, there were two causes of action. Again, one was negligence, and one was an intentional tort of intentional infliction of emotional distress. The apportionment or the percentages that were divided out under California law only applies to negligence cases. It does not apply to non-economic, which in this case pain and suffering, non-economic damages for intentional torts. Now, that's been the law, and it's been held in, for years and years and years in the state of California. And we're going to present that law on Monday because I believe the only portion of that verdict that could have ever been apportioned would have been the failure to report, which was negligence, not the intentional infliction of emotional distress, which is an intentional tort. And so it's my opinion as a lawyer, and I believe the court will see it my way. And if this court does or does not see it my way, I believe the appellate division certainly will. I believe Trinity's on the hook for the entire $2 million plus the costs that are allowed in the case. Yeah, so that way that they wouldn't have to take the court costs out of um... – Kara's winnings, right? Because that, that, that would correct. probably not leave her with, with much. Um, you know, we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to ask if you were the one representing Brittany in the, how many cases? It's over 20 cases they have filed against Brittany. Isn't that true? Well, she's, you know, I, I lost count after about 13 or 14. So <laughs> I say that kind of jokingly. I represented Brittany in almost all of those up until a point that um, her rep her representation uh, had to come to an end for other reasons. Let me let me give you a perfect example. Um, you know, and Brittany needed some deep pockets that could come along and help her defend this case. And so did Michael. You know, you're fighting against a multi multi million dollar organization that's willing to spend whatever money they can get to make their point. That doesn't mean their point's always legitimate. Okay. That, means mm -hmm. that just means that's the point they want to make because the imagery is more important than the facts. And so um, when you have a company willing to spend millions and millions on sound bites and disregard substance, then sometimes you can run people like Brittany straight into the ditch, and, and mm -hmm. they've done that. So, so obviously Brittany, um, as you know, is in bankruptcy as a result mm -hmm. of all of that. And mm -hmm. uh, she's fighting out in bankruptcy. I do not represent her in that. I represent her in several cases prior to that, um, which are still not resolved. None of them are resolved. But the bankruptcy has stopped all that process. And, and when it stopped, it also stopped my representation of her. Because oh, all those I see. When, a when a bankruptcy is filed, all other cases are stayed by, by federal law. You can't proceed with them until the bankruptcy is resolved. And that's why. Now, how come the courts can't see that these are harassment lawsuits? I mean, it, how could you file that many lawsuits against a girl who was just trying to bring financial accountability to a nonprofit organization? Um, you know what? It's interesting you ask that because I think some of the courts have seen that. Um, some of these cases that were originally filed from Judge David Carter in the uh, Central District of California in the U.S. District Court which is in the Southern Division of Santa Ana, um, clearly made the statement on more than one occasion that, you know, enough's enough, and even identified the, the activity as being vexatious litigation, um, mm -hmm. but ultimately did not make a finding. He basically put some restraints and said, no more filings unless you give me notice in advance. So that is, uh, I, I think it, that phrase has been tossed out there with Trinity, um, to my surprise, they've never actually been, you know, found that by any type of order. But certainly if you look at some of the conduct that you see with the entity um, and the practice, you could understand why it could be uh, just around the corner for them. 
when they do that type of stuff. Now, I have seen, I've not participated in, but I've seen other times involving Brittany in her current bankruptcy case where it appeared that they might have, Trinity might have had their hair cut a little bit from the court on certain behaviors, particularly early on um, in their efforts to get discovery and do depositions and things of that nature before uh, they were allowed to under the rules. Well, you know, we're running out of time. I just got one more question that I want to ask you. Yes. If if yes, Kara, if Kara and Brittany were to write their autobiographies, their own life stories, and actually get it published, do you think TBN would go after them, or is are they protected because their family members are public figures and they're just giving their own life story? Well, you can give your own life story, and, and you own your life, and that's just the way that is. I think the thing that you'd have to be careful of, and this would apply differently from Kara than it would to from Brittany, is you'd have to be careful about using information that you might be under some type of contract or confidentiality agreement under. Now, once that information becomes public because maybe it gets filed in public documents or maybe Trinity uses it in deposition without protecting it, um, then it's then it's pretty much open at that point. Um, but I certainly think that Brittany could 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 tell some stories that were not only true but that would shock the conscience. Um, I know um, from talking to Kara that certainly she could have a story that would shock your conscience too. But I will tell you, Jackie, in my opinion, Kara's thought process about this is maybe different than what you would expect. She's not looking to write a book to tell people how bad Trinity is. And I don't believe she has that type of, of uh, ugliness left in her. I think what Kara would want to do is tell her story because it's a story of hope. It's a story of someone that maybe endured something extremely horrible. um, And then went in as a fragile 13 year old to a grandmother who was a, you know, global rock star and went from fragile to broken um, and then never recovered from that and is still suffering as a result of it. And the key is that even though she suffered that and she still suffers, that there's hope after that type of incident. Okay. And well, I think you know, knowing we're at a t- heart, uh-huh. that's what she's going to do. I think. We're out of time now. Is there where's the, where can people reach you if they're in a situation that they need an attorney for such things? Absolutely. So 918-924-5101 is my office number in Tulsa. But let me give you something else. It's an email address. It's okay. david at david at k l g attorneys. Dot com. So K-L-G-A-T-T-O-R-N-E-Y-S dot com, and they can send me an email, and I'm happy to talk to them about it, happy to help people that's, that are in need. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us, and we're out of time. And until next week, everybody, keep on the lookout.